Is it a real tip? Okay. Yep, you look good. Thanks, Grant. And yes, to Paul Kopf. So this uh, presentation is around Kitalo project, and I'm joined today by uh, the Partha and Ian will join me in this presentation. And we also have a lot of teammates from Ketalo. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. All right, so getting started. Uh, yeah, you can also find us on Form and Dev if you ever have any questions. Is that on Libre Chat, Samir? It is on IRC. Uh, yeah, it's like Libera and chat. Yes. Oh yeah, we migrated to Libera. Yeah. All right. So let's get started. So what is Ketalo? So I have a screenshot here of what our project README says. The link is right here. But uh, let me get to this slide. So Ketalo here is a plugin to Foreman. Foreman is a tool. Uh, that system admins can use to provision, configure, run automated tasks on a lot of servers. You can monitor the server state and all of that fancy stuff. Ketelo is a plugin to Foreman. So Foreman provides us with the uh, host inventory, and Ketelo adds content management and subscription management to those hosts. So for subscription management, we use a project called Candlepin. And for content management, we use the very familiar pulp. And yeah, so I have a slide here which uh, defines what role fits into what. So for subscription management, as far as Candlepin goes, that, that determines the right of a host to actually consume content from Ketelo. And we have a concept in Ketelo of activation keys, so we will be going over that in, in our demo. So that is how we easily isolate content to make it available via pulp distributions to our hosts. Uh, and as far as content management goes, the part that Ketelo manages is creation of repositories, isolating them under products, creating content views, which are like snapshots of certain repository versions, and also providing ability to run certain tasks on host, like installing packages, removing packages, et cetera. We also have smart proxies, which allows us to deploy content in different geolocations, uh, for example, to make the content live closer to the host that are actually consuming that content. All right, so now we move on to the demo part of things. So can you see my screen OK? Yes. So this is the Foreman UI and how we have things organized are under products. And you'll also see organization here. So if you wanted more isolation, you could create multiple organizations. And we'll see how that comes into play. And then we have products. So here I have a product one. And it has uh, a total of six repositories, which are all of different content types. So these are OS3 isn't here, but these are the major content types that we support. All of these come from Pulp plugins. So we have Docker, we have collections, we have Debian, File, Python, and YAML. And I spoke about content views. So let's take a look at one of those content views here. So what content view does is allows us to add rep repositories to a content view. So I only have one product here, but if I were to have multiple, they would all show up in this view. And then you could like filter them out based on content type and add to the content view. So this does not make, make the content immediately available. You also have to publish a new version after adding the repositories. So let me just remove this because I plan to demo stuff. So right now I have two versions and 
Okay, let me also go over lifecycle environments quickly. So I mentioned we can isolate content for hosts to consume. One important piece to that is isolating under environments. So here I have some environments set up. We can have multiple paths. So we have, for example, a development environment, a QA environment, a production environment. And as you'll see, I have one content view promoted to the devil environment. And I should see a host here. I'm not sure what's happening, but yeah, there's a host attached to this devil environment. We'll see that later. All right, coming back to our content view, you can see we have one version here, which is promoted to devil and devil one environments. So any host that registers to these environments with this content view will have access to all the content in this version. And how you can see that is in the details view for the content view. So we have one repo published here, which has 32 RPM packages for Rata. You can look at all the RPMs that are made available in this version. Similarly, we have a version two. Let's go over filters quickly. So I have a filter here. So this is an exclude filter. And here we have a rule which says exclude any RPM named crow. And we let users see what will be filtered out here, for example. So it points to the exact RPM that will be filtered out. We'll see this in action in a bit. All right, so let's do this now. All right. So coming to our console, so let's see what how we organize stuff and how that relates to Catello, uh, to Pulp. So in Catello, we have a concept of root repositories. So this, as an object, holds uh, the common config info that all of the repositories stemming out of this root repository will inherit. So for example, we have the all of the re remote config in pulp terms lives on the root repository object. And things like name, label, et cetera, also live on the root repository. And what, what the other repositories mean is, let's see this. So here I'm picking out the yum type. So I have one yum type repository here and root repository here and a bunch of repositories that are child, children of that root repository. So here I have, so oh, wait, let me do a count. Here I have in this setup that I have, I have six repositories from one root. And let me tell you what each of those are. So there's, uh, if we go back to our UI here, so we have one yum repository here. So that makes for one library instance. Library is the default. Uh, environment that we have. And then we have the content view, which has two versions, which are promoted to environments. So version one is promoted to two. So that counts for two repositories in pulp. And then we have version two, which is promoted to one environment. That counts for another. So we have a total of four. And then for each version, we also store an archived copy of that repository for that version. So that makes six uh, total repositories for this setup. So similarly, if you keep publishing, we'll keep adding repositories in pulp, which correspond to each of these versions and the repositories there. <clears throat> All right. 
So is this repositories or repository versions? Each of these are repositories. Okay. Yeah, and they point to repository versions and they could be pointing to the same repository version or the same publication to be accurate. Okay, so, yeah, same publication. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same publication. So, uh, okay, let's do that. So, so, what we have here, let me add another query here. Okay, so I'm looking at distributions. So, this is where like Catalo or Pulp distributes the content. So, we have six distributions here, each corresponding to each of the repositories. And the path is defined as uh, so the organization environment, the content view, and custom is because it's a custom product, product name, and repo name. But all of these distributions, so there are six distributions, but there don't have to be six publications. So in this case, let me show that. For all of these, we have two publications here. So distributed, uh, distributed at six different endpoints. So why do we have two publications? Because version one, when published, did not have any filters. So we just copied over the publication from the actual repository here. So when we synced, we created a... Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah, so this library instance of the repository has one publication and the content view when we published the version one, we did not have any filters. So what wow. that does for us is, so we have logic wow. which checks if content has changed between source repository and the target repository. Target repository being the repository inside of this version. And if content hasn't changed for YUM repositories, we just copy over the publication in Catalo, which points to the same publication in Pulp. But if you do add filters, that's when we have to create a new publication and a new distribution for all of the versions in all of the environments. So here, for example, one of these publications is the uh, default uh, library instance of the repository, which is copied to I'll copy it to the version one distributions, and the other publication is the one with the filter published. Uh, okay. All right. I hope all of that made sense. So, in which case, we can move on to the next part of the demo, which is how do we use this content? So, Let's see all the hosts that our form an instance knows about. All of those live under hosts. So I have one host registered to the system. And by registered, let's also look at the activation key, which is used. So activation keys make it easier for hosts to uh, subscribe to content, you can also subscribe directly to content views using subscription manager, but uh, we use activation keys to make life easier. So activation keys uh, lets you define which environment you want the host to subscribe to and which content view inside of that environment you want that host subscribe to. Once you have this set up, you can spin up a host, you can run the subscription manager command, what that does is creates entitlement search on the host. And what that allows us to do is I have access to all of the repos that, that live under this content view. So CV1 in the library environment, because that's what the activation key says. So library and CV1. So that is the distribution that will be made available to this host. 
So whatever the publication is, let me try that. And, uh, so this is not pro protected. We are not using Content Guard for unprotect unprotected content here, so we can navigate through this. So we have all of these packages. This is the distribution that this host points to. Uh, now let me know how we use host actions. I'm trying to install Walrus. It has Walrus 5.21, the latest version. That's what gets installed. And now if I go back and look at my host, And if I look at packages installed, a lot of these uh, packages are not controlled by uh, the content view itself. Or many of these are installed packages. So subscription manager uploads a package profile for us, which includes everything that is installed on the host. And some of those packages come from content view. So for example, Walrus. So, just install Walrus. It will tell you what installed version you have for that package. And similarly, you have other tabs. If you enable disable module streams, if you have any installable applicable errata, you can look at how we do that. So let's get one applicable errata. Let's get one. downgraded walrus and let me go back to the errata screen now it will tell me one of the erratas is applicable you can look at that errata see what it has and you can also apply it directly from the ui so it contains walrus 521 let me apply this errata from the ui and hopefully all will go fine you can look at the job that gets started. So it did succeed. So it will show you what exact command it ran on the host. So this is the command that was run to show you what the output was of the UI itself. And yeah, so this is the uh, host workflow. So this is how the host consumes content from the distribution that we are uh, serving at, at a path, depending on the content view. All right, and one last thing here. So I mentioned smart proxies. So let's just dig into that. So here I have one smart proxy, which is, uh, Let's look into that. So this is the smart proxy UI. You'll see active features. So this is a content proxy. So this has pulp core as a feature. Under services, you'll see all these supported plugins. So all of these uh, plugins, if they live under the environment that the sub, uh, smart proxy is registered to, let me edit this. The edit screen shows you which environment this smart proxy is consuming content out of. So this currently is consuming content in the devil environment. So let's go back. So we have a content tab here. This appears only on content smart proxies and it shows you which environment your uh, proxy is consuming content from and all of the content views in that environment. So currently it has only one, CV1, which had one repository and it is synced. So we maintain some smart proxy sync history on our end in Ketelo, uh, which helps us to not call pulp. And whenever we do call pulp, we have 
options to sync with like an optimized sync or a complete sync. And what that means, let me also quickly show what we have on the proxy here. Here I have the repository list for the proxy. Right now, I have only one repository, which is the CV1 devil. So this name here, it looks weird, but this has a purpose. So if I were to go back to my uh, master server, let me see if I have that running here, or L. So how we map repositories between the master server and the uh, mirror repository on the proxy is using this pulp ID, which becomes the name of the repository on the proxy. So that is our connection between the master and the proxy. Do you uh, try to use the same name between the different objects in pulp, like the distribution? No. OK. So, but just the repositories have the naming convention. Yes. So, and how how this works is the distribution for this repository on master becomes the remote URL for the repository mirror on the proxy. So, let's see that. Uh, so, well. Let me see. So I'm looking at the distribution reference for the repository that we just saw. So the path here is default organization, devil, CV1, that it's consuming the repo out of. And if I were to look at our profile, let's look at the one remote that we'll have here. You know, the certs. So the URL will be pointing to the pulp content app, and the path is the same devil environment, CV1 content view, that repo. So that cool. is what, yeah. Um, my other question is, how is the syncing triggered? So a smart proxy, how is it controlled? From where? Yeah. So on the UI, we have this nice synchronize button. You can use optimize sync. You can use a complete sync, which overrides the optimized sync. And we have another action here, which is reclaim space. So this triggers a sync on all of the repository mirrors that live on the smart proxy. So it's like okay. a bulk task. And so, so the satellite, the Foreman server, that's the main one, uh, has a client that uh, talks to the REST API of the proxy and yeah. uh, starts the tasks there. OK. Yeah. So let me just run this, and hopefully this will succeed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I Never when you're live. <laughs> either sometimes if I have my server running for a long time and I change stuff. That's OK. Um, cool. As I call it, a case of Fridays. And then the other co uh, question I have is, when the proxy is being set up, does the main satellite uh, configure it? How does it get configured with the proper repositories on it? Uh, or does so the installer do that? Or like where the res does the responsibility? The installer just sets up the proxy and registers it to the uh, main foreman. And mm -hmm. So what that would get you is up to this point. So you'd have a smart proxy. And then you, you'd you have to set up which environment that proxy is consuming content from. Can um, each smart proxy consume only one lifecycle environment? No, it could have multiple, I believe, yeah. OK. Yeah. I'm going to interject here just to give you a time check, Samir. Um, oh, it's 35 I, past right now. OK, so all right, I'll move on. So we have 10 minutes for questions at the end of this. 
All right, so moving on to the 2022 part of things. So we have had several releases of Catalo using different versions of Pulp. So we had uh, 4.5 and 4.6, those run Pulp Core 3.18. And our next release is going to be 4.7, which we are almost uh, at branching. And that is using Pulp Code 3.21. So, and our nightlies as well are using Pulp Code 3.21. So, uh, we have, I saw a demo, I think, tomorrow where uh, we'll, we'll know more about packaging and stuff, but this is the upstream source of truth. So, I have the index here so you can check which pulp core version is being used in which kettle version but yeah and so right now in nightly these are the versions that we are on so you'll see uh pulp core 3.21 and similarly all of the plugins that their latest versions that kettle uses Okay, and we do have some more demos which are tied to some new features that we have implemented. So I'll quickly go over content view comparison because I know I'm running a bit over on time, but let's quickly do that. So, yeah. We added a comparison feature between two versions, which makes it easier to see on the UI what's different between two versions. So let me select two versions. And this will show you the difference between all of these versions. And this comparison supports all of the content types. So if there were, uh, say, files in this, in any of these two versions, those would show up. And you can filter by what's different. So no repositories are different, for example. And then we don't have Crow in version 2. So yeah, this is the content view comparison feature that we have added. I think this will be useful, especially because filters and everything are involved in between versions. So this uh, yes. is the new features. All right, I'll hurry up and hand it over to Ian so he can discuss ECS. All right, thanks, Samir. I'll just give the speediest demo in the world. Um, so another place that we uh, kind of improved our integration with Pulp is with the uh, introduction of alternate content source support. Um, I'm trying to talk and share my screen at the same time, which isn't working. Uh, <laughs> here we go. And this is something that's been wanted in Foreman and Catello for a long time. But now we finally have some UI support. Previously in Pulp 2, you would install something from Ruby or set up these configuration files. Um, but now you can actually do it through the UI, which is awesome. Um, and just a quick overview, um, alternate content sources provide an alternate location for you to download your RPMs from. So the main repository would be the source of truth for metadata, but then RPMs can come from wherever closer geographical location you want, or maybe some local file system thing um, on your system. Um, but just so to show how we're improving upon the ACS experience, um, we have a few ways to add alternate content sources. So the first way and the most simple is custom. It's literally just, we're just pushing information that pulp needs to make an acs um over to pulp so you can select the content type yummer file you give it a name you can select your smart proxies so we allow people to deploy acs to any smart proxy we kind of have a parent child relationship in our database where there's the main alternate content source record and then each alternate content source has smart proxy alternate content sources and those actually contain the information about the remote and the alternate content source hrefs so we can communicate to them properly so you could select any amount of these if you wanted and then for the url and paths this should all look familiar this goes directly into pulp you can set your base url and then you can set your sub paths as necessary um, and then 
for credentials. You can do manual auth if you need it. You can also use content credentials, which is just um, Catello's way of setting up SSL certs for you. So you'll go off in another Catello menu. You'll create your SSL certs, and then you can put them here. I have some certs for Rui, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, you can select a CA cert if you want to verify your SSL. Um, and then when it comes time to review everything, you can take a look at what you uh, added here, and then you can submit it. Um, but I will not create this ACS. Um, I want to focus more on the other two types, which are a bit more interesting. So one type that I think really improves the ACS experience is this new simplified type that we have. So all you need to do is simply select your content type, give it a name, select the smart proxies as you wish, and then you just select a product. So we have, I have this nice ACS product here. And what Simplified will do is it will automatically create alternate content sources for every single repo in that product. And the idea is you'll deploy this on a smart proxy. And that smart proxy will automatically sync from the upstream rather than from the Catello itself. And this is really helpful for Red Hat repositories. If you've ever wanted your smart proxy to sync from your closest CDN mirror, you can do that, um, which will could make your sync a lot faster than if you had to sync halfway across the world um, from your main Catello server to your smart proxy. Um, and we have all sorts of nice automation. Um, if you create new repositories inside your product, we'll automatically add them to your ACS. We'll remove repositories as needed. Um, and I'll just give a quick insight into how this looks. So our alternate content source is number 17. So we can look at the 17th alternate content source here. And you can see it has these smart proxy alternate content sources. And it has one for each of the repositories that I created. This product has two repositories. So there's two smart proxy alternate content sources. If I set this to be on another capsule, another smart proxy, you would see more of them here. And then lastly, uh, we also have a Rui type, which is just a reskin of the, cu the custom type, but it's made to help you talk with Rui. Sorry? Um, the alternate content sources, are they being created on the main Catella server, or are they being created on the proxies? They can be made on the say on the Catello server if you want, or on the proxies. Um, but, but, it, it, all, it all is up to what you select. Yeah, yeah. So what you described just now, having a proxy syncing directly from the CDN versus from the main server, mm -hmm. that's an alternate content source that you create on the proxy uh, that points to the CDN. Yeah, indeed. So the yeah. simplified ACS. This is a detail I left out, apologies. It clones, essentially, your repositories that are on Catello. So it rips the remote config from them, which is where shared remotes, um, what David mentioned in the comments, could maybe be helpful for ACSs. But we just clone the remote information over and use that to create the alternate content source remote um, on the proxies that you select. So it's totally transparent, and you sync. You get your certificates to sync from the CDN, for example. OK. Um, right on. And then, yeah, this last one, Rui. Rui is the Red Hat update infrastructure. It's a, it's a, it's a way to have Red Hat repos closer to your infrastructure. Um, it also uses pull. But we just give some nice ways to copy and paste things into Rui to make things faster. Like we tell you how to create your um, Rui certificates, or for example, after you select your smart proxies and all this good stuff, when it comes to the URL and paths, we have validation. So you need it. It will complain if it doesn't look like the path that, the, that really serves the content. And it also tells you how to list your Rui repositories. And it tells you how to find the info for your Rui repositories so you can find the subpaths. Um, this info command will print a bunch of information that will show the relative path that the repo is at. And you can paste them in here. So it makes it a bit easier. But really, it's just a custom ACS in the background. OK, so I flew through that. I want to make sure part that has enough time to present. So I will stop here. And you can ask me more questions later as necessary.
Awesome. Th thank you, Ian. Uh, I guess I'll present, I'll, I'll do my tab here. Oh, sorry, Partha. Let me, I, I meant to keep that up for you. You can, you can start talking and I'll keep it up. Okay, I'm just going to give a high level overview of the of something new that we worked on in 2022 and yeah, late 2021. Uh, it's called the import export uh, feature, or int we call it the on the upstream, not sure what we call it. No, on the downstream, we call it the inter satellite sync, but for all practical purposes, it's inter catello sync, if you will. Uh, so, <laughs> So the idea is there are a couple of scenarios that we are kind of interested in. Uh, one is one is this use case where oh it's inter th thank you Jeremy it's inter server sync. Uh, okay, so the the first scenario is what is what we call air gapped or also called as export sync. Uh, so the idea here is you know there is the content delivery network and uh, and the Catello upstream is talking to that. Uh, then there is a DMZ in the middle, uh, so there is no connection between the downstream servers and the Catello upstream servers. So we need a way to we needed a way to export content from Catello upstream and import them into the downstream. Uh, so this is one of the scenarios. Uh, next slide. The second scenario is as we have seen in in some play in some secure facilities and all they they in fact what they want is they wanted content isos so the the idea is you in the, you could get previously could get content isos from the cdn so what they would do is they would extract the iso in a in a, a pub in in a in a public uh, like in a in a local which web server that's accessible to all of the downstreams so they wanted to simulate that so what we did here is we said, okay, uh, so what we need here is slightly different than what we need in the first case, uh, because here we need the data to be open, like uh, data to be like, whatever we export should look like a YUM repository, a CDN repository for the downstream ones to sync properly. Uh, yeah, next slide. This is a third scenario we are also trying to address. What this is, this is called the connected case. So the idea here is the Catello upstream is able to access CDN, but the Catello downstream ones can't access CDN. So they they go through this uh, Catello upstream server to get the content. So what what this does is the downstreams are able to talk to the upstream, but not to the CDN. That's the scenario uh, that we're also trying to address. Uh, this one is this one is fairly straightforward now because uh, we have made the down now the downstream is able to pull pull from the upstream directly because we are we use the we use the pulp certificates the proxy uh, what the debug certificates uh, to get access to access to the content from the upstream pulp uh, so this is uh, this is already there uh, all all three are already there uh, next slide couple of a uh, couple of tidbits on exports. So we have something called a complete export. So, so in the Samir explained what a contribute version is. Uh, so the idea here is the customer wants to export everything in that version so that they can import it, or they may want to just export the deltas. So like, so if I'm in version two and I've already exported version one. I wanted I want just the delta between version one and version two to get exported. Uh, it fits very naturally into pulp. Uh, that's one of the good things here. So because uh, pulp pulp provides facilities for us to give uh, give us give them start versions. We will say, hey, start from this version and start from that version. So pulp knows how to create content out of that, and we we use that. The benefit of incremental is, uh, for example, if you have a rel seven. Uh, rel 7 repo whatever that's that's you that's like 50 gigabytes and usually like they're like you, let's say you were you're exporting every four days or five days there's, there's not much changes so incremental will make that possible the like incremental will only keep the delta so it won't you won't be like you putting you won't be importing like 150 gigabytes every day so uh, there are a couple of other 
tidbits here. Uh, we have a couple of export formats. One is called one is the default, which we call it the importable. The, uh, the idea is this is using pulp, pulp chain sets. Um, there's a second format called syncable. Uh, we'll I'll come over it in the next slide, the next couple of slides. So next slide, please. So the default importable format. So this uses the pulp core exporter. So you can be say, you know, like, hey, export this exact version or use these start versions. And so pulp is smart enough to say, okay, from this start versions, let's see what, what all the changed and gives gives us a change set. Uh, we also so and we, then we use the pulp core export functionality to do that, do the actual export and then uh, we generate a um, file called metadata json that is that is that has more the kitello side of things so it has has information like what was the content view what were the products what are the repositories in this in this in this j in this export file like so we use that as a way to like auto so when we do the import on this what we do is we look at the metadata json we say hey let let's let uh, these are the repositories that need to get created or enabled these are the content views that need to get created or enabled these are the versions we need of those content views so it's, it's fairly involved but it does a lot of things automates a lot of these things that we did not have before, so the hope is this will this will make the workflow easier. Uh, and we then use the pulp core importer and import versions. Uh, we then copy the con. Yeah, we finally do some ma some magic to <laughs> to get the content view versions the, the version of the items in the co version uh, in the content view to the library. Uh, so next slide. Please. So some of the so I, I just go with pros and cons a little bit. Uh, some of the pros in this default format is that it's it's more natural. Like pulp is doing all the hard work. Like the pulp know we just give it. Hey, here are the start versions, end versions, and pulp knows exactly what changed between two things. And it's very precise, a concise change set. We get a tar gz with the exact changes needed. Uh, and it's far more it's more reliable it's very reliable because we use change we, we use this in the increment export uh, it's it's a more way, reliable way to track the import export processes instead of doing something on your own uh, uh cons so the I, I don't know if there's a con really but it needs 2x space it used to require 3x space in a previous version of satellite but now Thanks to Pulp 3, we only need two times the space, but still can be a little involved. Like we get errors, like people didn't allocate enough uh, issues like that. So I didn't allocate enough space in their Pulp partition, for example. Um, so for example, RHEL 7 is like 50, 50 gigabytes right now. So if every time you're exporting RHEL 7, you're getting, you're, it's, it's adding 50 gigabytes somewhere in the pulp partition and a lot of people have problems with that uh so we get we get but th that's a that's a known thing uh the other part is the plugins need to be the same x.y version so like for example we export rpms ansible file and docker types these the, the, the uh, docker types like we export these four types and what needs to happen is like so the import the imp on the import side and the export side the pulp versions need to match at least the x dot y so it's like there's a 3.18 and a 3. Dot, it has to be a 3.18 on the other side also so if there's a pulp rpm 3.18 in one side there's to be a 3.18 in the other side also uh the problem here is the problem here is sometimes like even we are when we're releasing satellites we have slightly different versions of the pulp like so between so we kind of made the rule that it has to be if you're if you're on six if you're on sat 611 and you're on, you're trying to import to a sat 612 it's not going to happen like we have we've kind of made that rule uh but it's enforced by pulp because it needs the versioning to be similar uh 
but the downside is that that means everything has to get upgraded together. Like all your all your downstream servers have to get match up to the version that you have in upstream. And in a disconnected environment, it's like uh, it's like a wild west. Wild, it's like the wild west there. So uh, yeah, you you need the new bits. Yeah, to you be need there to do the upgrade. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of it is a little hackish right now. Uh, the air and the export format is not similar to a yum format so what happens is uh, in the air gap with the web server use case the picture where i showed you had where you had the web server on the other side and the downstream were consuming from that web server uh the the format that pulp exports in is not not yum it's it's optimized for using chain sets and all and the diffs it already has so it's very pulp is so it's pulp is particular in the way it looks and that kind of, what happens is a lot we had like we we got plenty of pushback saying mm -hmm. uh i i want the format to be exportable i want the format to be like i, I want the format to just look like a cdn server so so the idea is uh, so if i had rel7 it ha it has to show the content disk blah 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 the, the directory structure it has to show the listing files so what happens is uh, with the in the web server they can then go to the downstream and manually configure it they can point to this they can point to this uh, export and say hey import and the beauty of that is it will work even if the back end is 69 and we are exporting in 610 like the that this version we try to avoid this version problem next slide so yeah, export in a syncable format. So we, we do some. So this is the this is where the syncable format comes in. We we let the export is actually the, the idea of this is you export it and it'll export it in the CDN format. So it'll be like it'll look it look the same look content this blah 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 and and then it'll look the directory structure. So for an end user, he's not going to know it's coming from a CDN or from a web server. Uh, so it's kind of a easier thing for people who want to. Who want to massage the data their own way like we have some we have some people who are like they'll they'll take the export then they'll massage it in some way and then they'll provide it to the staff where to where to the internal servers and this kind of gives scope for that even though we don't recommend it but it's it's apparently a very common practice uh so because we because they don't have the con consultants who give them the massage data they don't have access to the downstream server, so they don't know which version the customer is actually using. And some departments you'll use six eight, some departments will use six nine, some departments will use six ten. Like it's it's like a that's why I call it the wild west because we don't know which version they're using. And so this syncable format provides a way for them to import and export in in, in at least the way they use they're comfortable with. They were come they were that's what they liked about six nine. They were very comfortable with that workflow. So. This kind of tries to help them there. Uh, so we use the pulp core file system exporter and exports. We specify uh, publication to export the metadata. Uh, we also use hard links instead of right. So the, this kind of solves that. In theory, it kind of solves the two x problem. It's I I know it's a kind of question, but the idea here is since we are using hard links, we're not consuming extra space. In that inode, we, 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 as long as it's in, the, it's in the same inode, like we're consuming very minimal extra space. Um, so the, the customer, for example, then can manually SCP it somewhere. But the second, yeah, uh, it's still 50 gigabytes of data, but they can manually SCP it instead of zipping everything together and then shipping that. Uh, I don't know how practical that is, but that's one of the benefits. Uh, and the hard links also makes it very quick. It gives us, uh, I was able to export, for example, 160 gigabytes worth of content in less than four minutes uh, using using this uh, strategy. So that is actually a definite benefit for us. Uh, and here you go. And the exports look like, as I said, a proper YUM repository with syncable content. We also generate the uh, the Catello generates these listing files because Pulp doesn't know. Uh, that's one of the things I would like Pulp to improve on. But uh, right now, right now we do the we do the generation of the listing files because we need it to look like a CDN. 
And again, on the import side, we have the same kind of setup. We, we auto create repositories, contribute artifacts based on the metadata JSON. But the trick here is the re repository remotes point to file system HTTP directory with the exported data. So I exported the data, I copied it to a web server somewhere. When we create the repo, when we when you run the import command, it automatically creates the repositories and say and automatically points to that web server. Uh, so so you are able to get your so you are able to run the regular pulp sync to pull it and. We then we have some smarts like once you've synced, we publish it. This is kind of like the old way of doing things, but uh, this is this is this is a better work. This is easier workflow for us. Many of the customers are familiar with the six nine aspect. Uh, okay, next slide. Martha, I'm going to step in here just briefly. Um, it's top of the hour. Um, I know we started late and you all have extra time and Ian's the one who comes right after you and has already expressed in chat that he'll be okay with you running over uh, my suggestion though is if we can like wrap this presentation up by 10 after give people a five minute break and then at a quarter past Ian can we pick up your um presentation at a quarter past instead of at the top of the hour and that'll run into the open time at the end which is yeah. unfortunate but we all know this is the way conferences work um does that work for everybody Actually, let me ask again. If anybody has a problem with that and has another suggestion, <laughs> raise your hand. I and I'm just letting you know this. Uh, this is probably the last slide I have uh, in from in terms of import export. So that's pretty much cool. Yeah. Okay. I don't see anybody raising their hand, so uh, we're going to let you go, and we'll go with that. So part of part of once part is done, um, I'm going to yeah. give everybody a five minute break. And we'll go straight into Ian's talk after that, and we'll have time for questions as we have time at the end of the at the end of Ian's talk. All right, thanks, Partha. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so again, the benefits of sync is like using hard hard links here. Uh, so as I said, the space is not that big a deal. Uh, they look similar to what you would see in a CDN. More flexibility. I, I went through all those. Uh, again, the con is that Catello needs to generate the listing files. Uh, we don't have. The other con is we don't have the equivalent of an incremental export yet. That's that's in the pipeline, I think. Uh, yeah, we, we'll hopefully figure that out. Um, and it's also harder to evaluate. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of harder to evaluate. It's not it's not as reliable because it's not using the change sets that Pulp already did. Uh, it's kind of like it's almost like you know I gave a I gave a file a bunch of files and someone synced. So. It's it requires a little more tracking from the user, which is kind of a painful thing. But uh, that's 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 the con. Next slide. Uh, Ian, you want to go with that? Yeah. Um, I can't check because the presentation's up. Is my mic on? It is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. You're good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. So we we all just kind of came up with a, a list here just of just a wish list of things. Um, some of these Samir put, so maybe he can explain more some of them. But um, one, let's see. I'll skip number one, because I think Samir might have had something. Or actually, Samir, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so this is the generic software engineering complaint. So we would want to have better logging messages. So I put an example there. If I were to refresh an ACS with a wrong URL, the error looks something like cannot open some temp file and then wrong compression type. So that is not very informative. We have several cases like that. So I think next steps for us would be to document all of the places where we would like to see better logic and hand it over to you guys. Yeah. That sounds realistic. Um, the next one is. Uh... Yeah, oh yeah, consistent support for n minus one smart proxy sync. So we have a thing where we want we have we allow users to sync an older smart proxy uh, from a newer Catello. And we just saw some issues recently about support for that. But I personally think the way forward is probably just to make sure we're communicating these requirements better. Because I think in the past it just worked and now we're at 321 and some th they were breaking changes. Um, so we'll just have to work to, to get over that. Um, 
They were not breaking changes. They were additive changes. Um, and you cannot use a newer client to talk to the older system. Right, but yeah. We're going to figure out what that support matrix looks like. Um, but yeah, I just want to make sure that the language was correct there. Yeah, I got you. It's more, yeah. The, I got you there. Um, so we'll have a an open dialogue about that. Um, we we do ha we have a meeting scheduled for next Monday. Awesome. And the other things. Um, so number three was just a thing I added. I thought it'd be cool. Um, kind of a a big future feature. You know, maybe it could never happen, but having some help with content copying could be neat. Um, cause Catella right now just tells Pulp what to copy. Um, and if there was something where we could tell Pulp, um, maybe, you know, copy this set of data from some kind of search or something like that. Pulp 2 had something like that. Um, maybe it could increase efficiency. I'm not sure because sometimes we have to hand Pulp these massive API calls. If someone wanting to filter in like all of, I don't know, some app stream repo it could get large and we have to do like a, a chunked API call, which makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, but I thought that could be fun if something could be implemented there like far in the future. I think we talked about this a long time ago, just as like a, hey, what if, but who knows, maybe filtering will look different in the future anyway for Catello. Um, and then the last one here was for import export. Uh, yeah, yeah, I already spoke about this, but uh couple of things I, I'm working on adding the issues, but we probably we should have an incremental export for the file system exporter and also find maybe some option in the file system exporter to generate listing files. I think uh, I'll, I'll create a couple of RFEs and hopefully we can get them sometime. It's pretty much all I have. But yeah, that was, uh, we don't have a last slide, but that was the end of the presentation. Um, Thanks, y'all, for listening. And I guess so we have a break, but if anyone has any questions now, I guess we can chat about things while we're around. Um, before we, uh, before I open, just let folk uh, ask questions, um, two things. First of all, Ian, can we get a copy of the, uh, the slides in a place where they can be linked into the schedule? Because I think that's a Google Doc. It's internal to like you have to be inside of Red Hat to see the Google Doc slides, is that correct? Or are they already external? I made it external. I exported it as a PDF and... Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. That's can... perfect then. It's hard for me to tell because I'm inside the firewall, but if anybody else can double check on that would be great. Um, the other thing I wanna, I wanna mention before um, we take a quick break here, um, in the schedule it is mentioned, and I will also post the link here in chat, um, we have a, a feedback poll for virtual PulpCon, and we would like folks to take a look at this. If you're only going to come one day, fill it out after you've been and gone. Otherwise, wait. You know, you can wait till the end of the uh, uh, end of PulpCon and fill it out. We really would like to get people's feedback on the various presentations and what you all want to see and what you liked and what you didn't. So keep this in mind. Uh, it's linked from the main schedule as well, and I, one of us will be mentioning it off and on over the course of uh, various events. Um, with that, I show 10 past the hour right now. I would like to um, give folk a, a five minute break. If you want to continue talking to Ian, go ahead. And Ian will kick you off at a quarter past. Does that sound good? Sounds good. All right.